to once then say thank you to the user organizing group and all the helpers and especially all the people with the our ladies Argentina that has made all of this possible. So we will be so we're ha very happy and excited to be giving this tutorial on predictive modeling with text using tidy data principles. All right. And you will be seeing me and Julia as the speakers. And we have all the um, links and information right here. That's right. We're both really excited to be here. So um, thank you all so much for um, for um, all the all the work that has gone into getting us into this place. Yes. So the plan for today is we're going to have a little bit less than one and a half hours of tutorial, we'll be doing a case study where we'll be talking about it with slides. And we will do a couple of breakout sessions where we'll be going through some of the code. We're going to see a little bit more what we're working with. And after the tutorial, you can look at the material on GitHub and the YouTube recording to run it code yourself. It is most likely not feasible for you to run the toad alongside as some of the toad chunks take a decent amount of time to run. All right, then off to Julia. So what we're, um, if you have come here um, and are interested in what we're, we're doing here today, you probably have run into somewhere in your working life as an as a analyst or a data scientist into, um, in, into like some text. And this is, and, and wanted to learn something about that text. And that is, um, that is very common for so many of us, whether we work in, um, in tech, in healthcare, in finance, um, we, we often um, get into this situation where we have text and we want to learn something from it. The case study that we're going to work on today is a case study from complaints that are um, submitted to the, the United States um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So the way that this, how did this data set get created? What is it? So the way that this works is that there's, there's a person and that person has a problem. They have a problem. They, they, um, they, they're using some financial product or service like a, like a bank um, or their credit card or they try to get a loan and they have some problem. And then what happens is they can, well, after they have that problem, they can submit, um, they submit a complaint. Um, can you go to the next? Yeah, yeah they fine. submit, <laughs> they submit that complaint to this organization. This organization is a government um, uh, bureau in the United States. And, they, and then when they submit this complaint, they explain what happens. So they, they actually um, go and they type in uh, what they what happened to them. So this is, t you know, text that is submitted to this government org. And then they we they it turns out we get a lot of other information along with what that happens. So they submit the complaint. And then what happens in real life after this is that um, the complaint gets um, sent to the company. Um, they can respond or dispute. And then um, this organ, what this, what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, what they're in charge of, is trying to make sure that um, in in the United States, um, consumers um, uh, for things like banks loans, credit cards, mortgages, that these things are fair, that these things are fair and consumers are um, treated well. So that, that's the idea here. So let's look a little bit and think about what's going on here. Um, so uh, this data set is available, publicly available. It, um, uh, you can go to this website and you can download it here. It's pretty big. So for the purposes of what we're going to um, uh, walk through here, we've actually subsampled it down. Um, and we, we show how much by here. So you can get, kind of get an idea of what's going on here. And the, this is um, a, a real data set where text 
um, with this case study that we're going to walk through where, where text is, um, has information in it, latent, latent information that can be used to learn something. We, we have information, other information too. We know when the complaint was submitted. We know um, uh, 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 like what company it's about. We know the zip code of the person of where it came from. We know when it was sent to the company. And then um, did the, you know, what did the company do about it? And all, you know, we have all this different kind of information of what is happening here. So let's just, uh, let's just uh, look at a few. We're gonna, we're gonna really dig into this a lot during the course of this case study, but let's just look at a few of these. So this just gives you an idea, just a couple, just a sample of a couple of like what the actual te text is. The text here is called consumer complaint narrative but here it says like um you know i opened a bank account with chase bank in xxxx um, a week after i deposited a check and then they go on and explain what happened and went wrong um uh the um i had a nordstrom visa credit card and it was closed you know like they like they're saying these things that went wrong so like this these are this this gives you an idea of the text that is here and then um uh, these are, this is an example of the kind of text that gets generated um, by all kinds of processes um, in so many of the different domains that we work on. When we get a glance at here, we, we already are starting to learn uh, some things about the text that we have. For example, this particular text has been um, uh, uh, censored or, um, or, uh, or, or cleaned um, in ways to protect people's personally identifying information. So that's one thing we can see already. All those X's are there to um, protect things like dates, um, people's credit card information, locations, and things like that. So let's take a step back and say, what is it that we're trying to do um, can you go to the next slide, Emil? What is it that we're trying to do when we, when we do something with this kind of text? So um, we, they, text like this, we can do exploratory data analysis with, we can build unsupervised um, you know, models with and learn what's in there. But text like this also can be used for supervised or predictive model, modeling. We can, we can, much like we are used to using nice rectangular data that are numbers to build some kind of predictive model, we can, we can use the, um, the unstructured text data to do this as well. We can build you know, just as, as we are used to building regression or classification models with other kinds of data, we can build those same kinds of models with text data. So um, in this case study that we're going to walk through today together in this tutorial, we're going to build a classification model. It's going to be a classification model is what we build today. But we can build um, regression models. We're going, to, we're going to walk through a binary classification model that you can build, you know, multi-class classifiers. Like, like many of the um, uh, options that are available to us in our general modeling toolkit are available to us when we use text. The, the hump to get over, the thing to get over is that we have to, um, <clears throat> we have to use um, the, the structure that is in language. We, we might say the, the organizational, um, uh, the ways language exhibits organization to be able to create features for modeling. So we have to do the work of feature engineering we have to do the work of um, data pre-processing would be a way that we might say this, depending on, you know, what kind of language we want to use. We have to create the features for the modeling to be able to get to that step. So there are specialized um, techniques. There, there are, you know, what we're about to talk about, like specialized packages that get us from the, the unstructured data to the features that 
that we can use in our um, uh, well-tested, familiar um, uh, modeling approaches. And I think one important note here is also that, as we saw before, that the, the field in which the tests are in can be very varied in length. And we still need to make sure that we get back to a rectangular data set. So we need to, even if the test has 10 words or 10,000 words, we still need to find a way to get it into the same rectangle so it will fit in our models we're using. And almost more importantly, we need to get numbers out on the other end because that's what the models actually need to use. So for this, we will be using the tiny models framework, which is a collection of packages that are developed to help and ease modeling and machine learning workflows. And it uses the tidyverse principles. It is in a way a successor to the carrot package. So it doesn't implement a lot of the methods, like statistical methods themselves, but add binds and hoods and a lot of the workflow problems are being eased with using tidy models. And then to be able to do, turn the, our test features into numerical features, we'll be using the test recipes, which is a package I have been developing that handles a lot of the different ways you would turn test features into numerical features in a way that fits uh, perfectly into the tidy models framework. And our general workflow is we'll be starting with some pre-processing. So we get some data in and we will split it. We will do some pre-processing, give it to a model where we will train it. So it would be a logistic model, a random forest, and it will do the modeling in there. And then we, at last step, we want to do some validation. So we want to see how well does our model actually perform at the task we specified it to do. Yeah. And one thing, um, like when you look at tidy models as an ecosystem, um, you, you can think of your mental model of it of being similar to, to the tidyverse, where it's a meta package that contains a lot of smaller packages and each one is um it's 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 modular so, um so that if you you know if you only need functions from one you can only you know load up that one and they're they're broken apart so that each um part of like a modeling workflow here is kind of in one in one um separate package so much like when you do low if you're familiar with saying library tidyverse and understanding that oh this gets me ggplot2 and dplyr and tidyr if you do library tidy models in a similar way it um it gets you all these different packages that ha that are have specific um emphases and um uh, and uh, uh, functions. Yes. And this thought is very nicely accomplished with a long-standing project that Julia and I have been working on. So starting a little bit over a year ago, I approached Julia with an idea for a bird, and we have been slowly working on it ever since. And we're very happy to officially announce uh, the bird we are working on. So the book is called Supervised Machine Learning for Test Analysis in R. And it has, like, we have a rough draft of the first two thirds of the book. Since the name is a quite a bit of a handful, you can find it as smltar.com. So Yeah, and wait. Emil, how do you like to say it? I like to say it small tar. Yes, and yeah. that's, we almost, saved it with bought the domain without the a <laughs> so <laughs> that's then, true we did yeah. <laughs> we're like oh no there's an a <laughs> yeah so 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 a lot of this taught tutorial is based on material on the board and we won't go nearly as much in depth as we do in the board so if you need a more deep explanation you can go after the tutorial and find the corresponding chapter. 
Yeah, that's great. There's one question so far that I think now might be a good uh, time to address. There's questions here about how well this works with the STM package. And the STM package is a package for topic modeling, which is an example of unsupervised machine learning. And um, uh, what we're going to focus on today is supervised machine learning. So in the way, a way in which they're similar is that both um, both uh, work well with um, using a um, like a tidy data principles approach to your text analysis. Um, like if you want to use if you want to use um, like broom style like tidying of your output. <clears throat> uh, uh, however, a difference would be you would use STM if you have unlabeled data and you want to do unsupervised modeling. Um, and you would use uh, the approaches we're talking about today, text recipes, supervised machine learning, if you have labeled data and you want to train a classification or a regression model. That actually is exactly what Emil is about to talk about, is like uh, dealing with the labels on our data. Yes. So one of the first things we need to find out is we want to predict something from this data set. And in this case, we have this um, hypothetical scenario where someone forgot to label what kind of complaint it is. So uh, um, in this data set, there is eight different territories. So you have complaints about mortgage or student loan or credit card and prepaid card. And there's a bunch of different territories, but as we can see right here, there's not an even amount of complaints within each class. So for the remainder of this tutorial, we will be lumping, so everything in the most common class will be lumped into one class and then everything else will be lumped into our second class. So we turn it into a binary classification test. So let me just quickly share my, my word space. So we have, and as a note, both Julia and I have already pre-ran all the code in these chunks because some of them take quite a bit longer. But we can see right here, so we have the original data right here, which takes a little bit of while, a little while to load in. A lot of bit while. Oh yeah. So you see we have all the data right here and we have date received. We have the product. So this is the class we are trying to predict. And we have a lot of different fields. What we are what we'll be doing now is we are taking our complaints and creating a factor of two levels. So one level if the class is this very long credit reporting, credit repair services, and other personal consumer reports, and then labeling everything else other. That way we're t having a factor variable with two levels. And additionally, for to save a little bit of room on the toad, we are renaming consumer complaint narrative into text because it's a long word and we started having a little problem with room on the slide. So you can see now here we have the same data as before and we can say complaints. Wait. Uh, complain to less and we can count the product and we see we have a roughly more or less even distribution between credit and our other class. Which is really convenient for us now. Yeah. And yeah. it's not to say that you can't do a multi-class classification, but for the purposes of keeping this tutorial fairly short, we are simplifying our test a little bit. This is the identical we used to turn our data into a multi-class. 
Exactly. Um, so once, uh, so we have this, um, now, now that we've said, okay, we're going to do this binary classification, um, we're going to approach this as a binary classification task. And so then the, 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 one of the very, pretty much the first step after we've gone through um, exploratory data analysis with our data, and it's for, time for us to start the modeling process, is to think about splitting our data. Because uh, many of the machine learning um, approaches that we can take with any kind of data, but including text data, can be very powerful. And they can um, uh, memorize features in the um, in our data. And we, we want to be able to have a, as good a possible of estimate of how, how good of a job is this going to do if we're going to apply this to new data. And so to do that, we need to have um, held out data. So we need to have some data that we're going to um, train on and some data that we will use to test how well our model is doing. So uh, in almost any realistic situation, we have, we have a given amount of data and we, we have to um, think about that data as, um, as like, uh, like a resource that we have to um, spend in some way. So uh, one way that I like to talk about this is like we have to spend that data budget wisely. So um, the this little visualization that we have here is like a typical um, test train split. So you start with certain some certain amount of data. And then we randomly assign some amount of it to your, tra your training set. And that is the data that we'll use for training all the models, all the models that we might want to try out. And then the test set is held to the very end. And the test set, like we have here, we've said here on the slide, is a, is a precious resource. And we can only use it once. And the purpose of the test set is not to compare models, is not to decide which one is the best to use. The purpose of the test set is to estimate um, performance on new data. The purpose of the test, is, test set is to say, how is my model going to perform on new data? So let's, um, let me uh, go here. Here, so um, and just show uh, a little bit about um, if I have got. So let's say I have that complaints uh, to class that um, that Emil just made, where we where this product has now been um, has now been um, uh, has now been uh, dichotomized into the, these two. We're going to say, is this about credit or is it about any one of those other kinds of things? So what we want to do is we want to split it. So let's look at this split object here that we have. So the split object here is, um, let, like, let's see, what is it? What is this thing that we made? Complaints split. Um, it has class R split, and um, it's like a Monte Carlo split thing here. So if we look at it, um, it is a, it's, it's not a data frame. If you're used to using um, tidy data, like what is this thing? What is this thing? When it prints out, it says, okay, I started with this much data, that's the total, and then I put this much into the analysis set and this much into the assessment set. So the data isn't in here. What this is doing is it's saying I'm keeping track of which um, of which observations go into the training and um, testing. So analysis is like training and assessment is like testing. And so the way I actually get the data out are with these um, or with these functions. So I, I'm going to run this one, and then I'm going to run this one. And so now let's look at them and see how big they are. So complaints train, notice that it is, um, uh, it has this many rows, almost 9,000 rows. And then complaints uh, test has um, about just shy of 3,000 rows. So the, the, um, the, the default for initial split is to split uh, it three quarters, three quarters in training, um, one quarter in um, testing. But that's something that you can change if you have different needs for your um, particular uh, modeling 
question, but that, that's why it ended up splitting in the way that it did. So notice that both of the, so that, so this thing does not have data in it. It just keeps track of which observations go where, but these things both do have data in it. And we've used these functions to say, okay, okay um, I know where the data is and I need to go get it. And so that's what these things are and they are ready to, um, they are ready to go. And, but, and so now we have these data sets, it's just data frames, but we don't, now we, now we as modelers have to decide what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we, in this case, we have both text and other, um, and other um, uh, variables. And so now we have some choices to make, don't we, Emil? Yes. So, um, yes. So we have these 18 different variables and we need to find out which one of them will we be using in our modeling. And for this, we have a very ad hoc uh, feature selection list, chat list. So first and almost most important question is, is it ethical or even legal to use these variables? So using variables such as race and sets and gender may or may and very often not be ethical and even in some cases be little for you to use in your predictive modeling. And this even starts to include things like zip code, which is often used as a proxy to race. So we need to be aware of what we're allowed to do, but I would say almost more importantly, what is the effortful thing to do because laws tend to be rather slow in that regard. The second, uh, thing we need to make sure of is, is the variable we use to train our predictive model available at prediction time? So since this data set has been created afterwards, some of our variables are created after we would actually be able to use them in the model once, it, uh, once it's being put into production. And lastly, does the variable, is the variable likely to contribute anything to the explainability of our model. So let's take a look at, so keeping these three chats in mind, let's take a look at our data one more time to see what we can say about it. So we already talked about how we have the zip code. So we have the zip code right here. It's very unlikely that, it's not a good idea to really use it because we most likely just gonna be able to find areas with uh, uh, racially saturated areas, which we're not allowed to and we shouldn't use. And in some way, we might even say that the state has a little bit of the same feel. And it seems weird to maybe think that one state should be more likely to do something than another state. Then we have the, will it be available at prediction time? So we have, so we're assuming that this model is being put in production when the complaint is being received by this government entity. So a variable like date sent to the company is not available at prediction time because that's gonna happen later on. The same with the response from the company after they have received is also not something that will be available. Same with time response is we will be looking at this way before. And lastly, uh, here we actually have a variable that may or may not give us any, any thing valuable. So we have the complaint ID. So this is most likely just, uh, it could be a sequential number denoting how often the, just a unique identifier of the complaint itself, which doesn't give us any information at all. At most, if it's sequential, it could be a proxy for time, but we already have a better explanation. We already have a accurate variable in the date received. So we will be using the three predictors right here. So we have the date received. We have the TATS, which is a low cardinality factor variable of what are you? So there's like an other, and then they have like service members and elderly 
and things like that. And then lastly, we have the consumer complaint narrative, which is the test. And before I hand off to Julia, I want to make a note that we are not only using test data, but we are using it in addition to classical predictors. Yeah, yeah. We had a question that um, we that uh, we I, was great to um, address. If you can go back just a couple of slides to where we show the initial split. In the initial split, we uh, initial split with strata equals product, and the that conducts strata stratified sampling. So that the so remember product is our class uh, our. Um, uh, credit versus not um, uh, variable. And so when you say strata equals product, what we're saying is um, I want to make sure that my, um, my test and my train um, have equal proportions of, the, of uh, uh, this, which is our outcome variable. This is the thing we're going to predict. So that is what, um, uh, that is what the strata argument does there. Um, this particular data set uh, is actually pretty even in strata, so it probably would have turned out mostly okay without it specifying that, but what this does is it makes sure that it is the same. So it divides the data set by strata and then samples actual after you've divided it. Awesome. So if we, um, so we've got these, we've got these features. We've decided what features to use, and so now it is time for us to do this transformation to um, pre-process our data to get it ready. And uh, wow, look at that pile of code. That's an enormous, that's an enormous pile of code there that we've got. And um, what? So this, so think about this. I. I I invite you to think about this in a variety of ways, depending on what you find helpful. So you can think about this as a, a way to specify how to pre-process your data. Like your data came to you in one form and you can pre-process it in a way to get it ready for modeling. Or you can think about it as feature engineering. Your data came to you in some form and you're building a machine learning model and you need to engineer the features. These are equivalent in my mind, in my opinion. And uh, what, so what we're doing when we have this huge pile of code here um, to get your data ready for modeling is you are in a principled, um, reproducible way, making it so that you can, um, uh, uh, get your data from the form it came to you in, in a form that is ready to go into a, to a model, into a, um, some kind of machine learning algorithm that is, that it is ready, that is where, where it is ready to go here. Um, before we move on, let's just notice Let's just, let's just, I want to look at things. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on here. But one thing I just want to draw your attention to um, here. Look at that. It says tune. What does that mean? I don't know. We're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that one. Okay, let's keep going. And um, let's notice one thing that we did here. We're combining text and non-text features in our model. And so, um, I'm going to walk through, um, uh, first I'm going to walk through it via live code, through, through coding so you can see what's going on, and then we'll just show the, the slides again. But we are, um, we are looking at, we are looking at a combination of, um, uh, uh, of, we are looking at a combination of, um, text and non-text features. And that's one of the really great things about using tidy models for this. So let's start with this first line. Um, we start by defining a recipe. So a recipe in this um, ecosystem is a way of saying, um, I want you to pre-process my data and get it ready to go into um, a machine learning model. And the first part of it here is, is a formula, like if you use R for modeling, um, you, pro you probably have seen this kind of formula before where we say, this is the outcome, these are the predictors, and here's the data. Notice that we're using the training data here because um, much like a machine learning model has to 
learn from training data and then be evaluated on testing data. Um, data pre-processing also has to be learned and then evaluated because otherwise we um, uh, have data leakage. So um, this is how we start. So first, let's look at these first ones, dates dates here. So um, these three rows deal with that date column. This is the date that the complaint came in. This, this function, step date, um, so what we're going through here is we're adding steps to our data pre-processing um, specification, our feature engineering. We're saying, ah, I've got a date column, which it turns out is kind of a weird thing in our, um, what am I going to do with it? I need to make something that's, that can go into a machine learning algorithm. I can do math. I can do linear algebra on. So I'm going to take that date and I want to get out some features. I want to get out the month and the day of the week. So instead of having um, a date column, I'm going to now have the month and the day of the week. So what I'm, what I'm going to, what I'm getting at here is like, Hey model, um, uh, are people more likely to have problems to submit problems with credit, with their credit, uh, consumer products? Um, during different months of the year or like over the course of the year or a different days of the week. That's what, by, by doing this feature engineering, I'm taking the date and I'm getting out different features. Then I'm like, I, I don't want to keep the date itself. I'm getting rid of it. Step RM and then step dummy. So it's step that this is, I'm creating indicator variables, um, uh, which are binary, um, numeric binary columns um, from like a factor column. So that's what this is doing. So if I do this and then don't stress out about this next part too much. Uh, I'm demonstrating it, but if you, you're like, whoa, what's going on? Don't stress out. Just kind of like look at the, just kind of look at the outcome. I'm, I'm just showing you what it's doing. So it, uh, it's not handling the tags of the text, but I'm taking the product is still here as a factor, but look, it's made columns like um, August, September. It's made columns like Tuesday and Wednesday. So that's what these first, that's what these first um, couple steps are doing. So now let's do the tags and I'm going to delete the so Julia, before you move on, we have a yeah. question about uh, data data leakage. Ah, in yes, general. Yes, that is. Oh, okay, okay. So, what is data leakage? So, data leakage is when you end up using you're training a model, and you get some data to train your model with, and you say, okay, here, I, here's my training data, here's my testing data. And accidentally, you end up using some information from what you thought was the testing data when you train the model, and then you end up with an overly optimistic evaluate, like estimate of how your model is going to do. So it is very easy, it turns out, to um, have data leakage. Uh, let, um, would, you, would you like to explain it in any other way, Emil? That was kind of short, what I just said. Yeah. So one of the ways I think about it is if you have data leakage, you're, you're using te uh, data for uh, the information from the testing data set, which in a way is using information from the future to affect how your model behaves now. And this is only going to be a problem once you push it into production and don't know about what happens in the future because the model you fit assumes that it will know what happens in the future. Yeah, that's another great way to put it. Um, I think that um, uh, in machine learning practice and modeling practice, I feel like we've gotten a lot better at talking about the modeling part um, with data leakage, like data that we put into the machine learning algorithm. And it is much, but we still don't have great practices around data pre-processing when it comes to data leakage. And um, that's one of the real benefits of using tidy models and recipes specifically is that it makes a lot of that very explicit, very explicit. 
Um, so let's, so, whoops, Daisy. So we've got here this, um, the tags. So, so now um, if I'm going to do, now I'm, now I'm dealing with another column. I'm going to do step unknown, which handles, what do I do if I, if I don't have something there? Because remember we saw we had like a bunch of NAs. Um, so I give a new, call, I knew a new value for that. And then I do this same where I create the indicator variables. And so I can do the same thing here, prep, um, juice. So don't worry about that part too, this part too much. So now the tags, older Americans, tags, service members, tags, unknown. So I've created these columns. So these are, that's what, that's what I'm doing with these steps is I'm getting ready to make all these columns that I'll be able to put into a machine learning algorithm. I'm not going to run it for the text one because it gets a little bit um, hairy, but let me just tell you, uh, so I'll just show you the, um, the results here. Um, so, so if we put it all together, what we're doing is I'm creating date features, getting rid of the date, um, creating indicator variables, which means making those columns that are like, yes, no columns. Is it in November or not? Um, the same thing for the tags. And now we're getting to the text, which is the thing we're actually, talking about right so I we tokenize text which means breaking text apart into pieces we'll talk a little more about this later we're removing stop words for text um, we'll talk about a little bit of this more uh, later too we remove um, uh, words that are not too informative um, we uh, find engrams um, then we remove things that are not um, uh, uh, we decide how many basically we decide how many um, tokens are we going to keep in this model? And then at the end, we, um, we weight this by TFIDF, which is a, um, a statistic that you can measure about a, a word in a document, in a collection of documents. So it, 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 um, it weights, so TFIDF weights up words that are important in one document in a collection of documents and it weights down um, words that are in all of the documents. So it looks, so it's a, it's a way of weighting the words. So, so at the end, what we have here is um, we had all, we have this data coming in and at the end, what we have is um, a way of um, processing our data so that it's ready to be used in a machine learning algorithm. Emil, I talked about a lot of steps there, including stop yes. words, didn't I? Yes. Uh, and I just want to do one last note on this is uh, specifying this recipe barely takes any time at all because we're not actually doing the calculations. That's going to happen later on. So by specifying it takes like a fraction of a second because we're just saying what are we going to do we're not actually doing it which is one of the cornerstones is the tidy models is just specifying what we will do all right so do we have and I, we had a tweet note uh question is the roles equal dates so that's basically saying we have all the variables coming out of this step up here we're saying Diff them to roll dates. And then it's not this slide right here, but then we uh, later have, when we do the dummy, we are saying apply dummification to all the states, all the variables that have the role equal to dates. So it's a way of just selecting multiple variables but at the same time. Um, yes. Chat. Let's just keep going to stop words in the interest yeah. of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so stop words. So we talked about removing stop words. So stop words are very loosely defined as words that have very minimal meaning. So hopefully it will be words that we can remove with little to no loss of predictive power. And it's commonly used, like you think of the words such as and and off and eh and, and just words that kind of just needs to be there to make the sentence sound nice, but hopefully it doesn't add too much information. Turns out there is 
but as many stop word lists as partitioners in a way. There's so many different ones. There's a lot of problems with all of them. And they're very specific. So here, if we load in the stop words package, we can call stop words, which defaults to the snowball stop word list. And we can see the first words right here. So at a glance, they do look like, oh, there is most of these words don't seem like much, but we still have some words that may or may not be that, may or may not be exciting. So the first step would be we have a lot of pronouns. So we have like she and, and, and he and those which may or may not be important. Like you may want to remove or may not want to remove depending on what you're doing. Yeah, before we uh, go on to uh, the next slide, it is, there's actually pretty good support for stop words in other languages. And there's a uh, kind of an interesting, um, um, uh, uh, plot in one of the chapters in the books about um, removing uh, yes. stop words for a bunch of different uh, languages. So um, that if you were someone who is a practitioner with text in another language, that's a kind of interesting thing to look at. And I think it's very important to note that if you're using a stop word list, you should manually check every word on that list before you use it. Because them that might, it might have words that you don't want. And some of these lists have been computer translated and may or may not be tested by a native speaker in that language. So here we have a upset plot of just three of the commonly used stop word lists, commonly used in R. So we have the snowball. So first we have, in the lower left, we have a histogram of the number of stop words in each list. And we have stop words down here with, I think, 171 stop words. So it's fairly short. And then we have the ISO stop word list, which has almost 1,500. So already there we have, oh, we actually have them right here. So we have 160, actually, that's not right. But we have tried a bit gap between the number of stop words in different lists. So they we have some conservative one and some quite liberal ones that may bleed into important information. And we see that the stop words that they add along the way overlap, but don't, so actually the most important on this one is we have this little 10 right here on the fifth column, which is basically saying that we have 10 stop words in the snowball list, which is the smallest list, and the ISO list, which is the biggest list, that don't appear in the smart list. So they are not perfect subsets of each other. And this is just looking at three. There's many more that has other problems. Another important note is stop words are content specific. So these lists we've shown so far are trying to be English <laughs> specific. But if you start doing inter-domain, certain words stop having meaning. So if we did a classifier on like documentation in our packages, the word function stops having any meaning because it's going to appear basically everywhere. Where the word he and she maybe suddenly becomes very important because why would they appear in uh, our documentation? They will also have bias from in various degrees. And it can happen, and then it's a little bit content specific. So if you use a stop word list defined in one domain and try to transfer, you're going to have some bias in that way. Another thing you might find is if the stop word list is generated on towns, you can get into problems of having some male pronouns while not having the female pronouns because it's being trained on uneven data. And you can, of course, modify and create your own stop word list to your specific need. So if you know from your domain knowledge in the test you're doing that, oh, these certain words like package and function and namespace, they don't add anything. So you just add them in and say, we don't want to look at these words. And as always, there's more information in chapter three, where we look more into how stop words are being used. 
Before we jump into models, there's one question I want to address right now, which is like, how well does this data pre-processing extend to other languages? Since, you know, we've talked a little bit about it. And the infrastructure, uh, the question was specifically about like recipes. And the infrastructure is general. The infrastructure for um, data pre-processing is general. One thing that we uh, want, uh, like a well, real goal that we have had like in the book and that we want to talk about here is the specific pre-processing steps do um, have a uh, uh, different outcomes for different languages and different kinds of language and that's because they have been developed typically by dominant uh, by people from dominant um, cultures and backgrounds and so for example the stop words are you know like the the stop words that are the best quality are English the stop word lexicons that are the best quality are the English ones and so you go to use the other languages and they're okay, but like less good. Um, when you go to, you were, we're going to talk about tokenization in a little bit. Token, and we're, you know, it's going to, it's one of our slides, is that um, like tokenization um, works best for English. And that's because when we have made, like everyone who's made these algorithms tends to work in this domain. And so the recipes infrastructure is general. Um, the, 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 in the, the, inequity that we see when it comes to what are called high resource languages and low resource languages come from the pre-processing steps. And um, we, we talk about that um, uh, at several places in our book and what to be aware of and how to, um, at the very least, um, acknowledge the limits of what it is that we're doing. Um, we'll, we're going to address some of these other questions as we go along. Right now, what we're going to shift to talking about, so we've, we've been spending a some time talking about getting your data to the point that it can go into a model, that it can go into a, some kind of um, algorithm some, that's going to do math, you know, that's going to do like some kind of like machine learning algorithm. So what we want to talk about next is what kind of models um, <clears throat> work well for text. Like if you're, if you're, it's like, okay, I, I come, it's time to train a model. What am I going to, what should I do? What do I need to know? So um, the most important thing to, um, to know, to keep in mind, is that, um, is that text data is sparse. Um, sparse in the sense of like a sparse matrix. Sparse in the sense that um, uh, most documents... Don't use most words. So um, uh, there's a special name for this kind of relationship in, in languages called Zipf's law. So um, most words um, are not used many times. A few words are used a lot of times. And so we end up with these sparse representations. And so this is important when it's time to pick a model. So for, for models, you want to pick models that work well for sparse data. So um, uh, one of my like go-tos, the go-to actually that we're going to use in this case study is a regularized linear model. So uh, in R, the, the big one is that um, is, uh, is uh, GLMnet or GLMnet. I don't know. I hear it pronounced both ways. Emil, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> I spell it out. <laughs> you spell it GLM net. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know. I hear it pronounced both ways. So that's what we're gonna use. Um, support vector machines also work quite well for um, for text data. Uh, Naive Bayes is also really a good fit for text data. That's because um, it uh, it treats all. You end up with a ton of features. Like um, the features in this case are words or tokens or other kinds of like engrams, something like that. And so you have a ton of features, and Naive Bayes treats them all independently, and so it can chug chug away and get you um, to, uh, to you can you know, it can fit and train. What about tree based models? Things like random forest. No, no, tree-based models do not perform well with um, text data. Th this is actually kind of a something to, um, to note, 
to, um, to remember because in general, random forests are kind of um, a mainstay of machine learning, right? Like you, you have some data that comes along and you're like, what are we going to do? Um, throw a random forest at it, right? Like, like there have been studies, right, that it's like one of the big, it, like they, they perform really well in almost in so many different circumstances, but tree-based models do not perform well on sparse data. They, they can't take advantage of the sparsity very well. They just don't tend to do great. So um, this kind of information is important to um, keep uh, in, in, uh, um, uh, in mind when we, are, um, when we are choosing what kind of model to try um, for our text data. So I keep saying that text data is really sparse, but does text data have to be sparse? Is it always sparse? Um, so uh, there is a whole field of like NLP, a whole sort of subfield of NL NLP that the point of it is to use the information in text um, to transform this high dimensionality sparse space where we have the language data to a lower, no lower dimensionality dense space. So there's this quote from John Rupert Firth, who is a linguist, where he says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So um, this is the idea of word embeddings. So if we have, um, if we have, uh, we can learn from a large data set of, word, of language, which words are used together. And then we can use that to transform, like uh, instead of a TF-IDF weighted high, high dimensionality sparse data set, we can transform it to a lower dens dimensionality dense data set that uses how, how, um, how, language, how words are related to each other. We can use that together. So I saw that there was a question like, like what, maybe I should, maybe we should, like why use TF-IDF and weigh it that way? Why not use word embeddings? So chapter five of our book is about word embeddings. And um, uh, I recently gave a webinar for YR that focused all about that. And um, this is definitely an option that's out there and one that you can use, tidy models and tidy recipes to do. It, this is for sure a, um, an, uh, a step that should be taken um, with full, with a pretty full knowledge of the, um, of the um, uh, basically risks involved. Because more so than other text pre-processing steps, this is, um, this is a pre-processing step that uses um, historic um, uh, 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 bias um, in large data sets and then ends up uh, ends up uh, built in and baked into your model so um, uh, I, we were, we're not going to talk any more about word embeddings today but point you to these other resources so that's a little bit about models um, a meal. Let's talk about how we actually practically go about building a model. Yes. So when we're building a model in tidy models, we have three main steps. So first we need to pick the model we will be using. So that would be our linear model, naive base, GLM net model. So just the a, a statistical model framework we want to use. Then we have to set the mode. So the mode is what kind of regression, or well, what kind of modeling do you want to do? So the classic ones are regression and classification. And then lastly, and lastly, we need to decide the engine. So what package or library is actually doing the calculations later on. So here we have the, the wonderful art from Alison Horst. And so we'll be using Parsnip to do all the modeling. And Parsnip adds as a standardized interface for feeding the modeling. So it doesn't 
include any of the code to actually run the models themselves, but it attaches hoods into other libraries in R and outside of R to handle the computations for you. And it, we have here at the title models.org slash find slash parsnip. There is a little searchable area where you can find the different models and model types and what patches they're from. And there's more and more being added along the way. So first we need to, so first we specify a model. So let's say we are doing a support vector machine with a radius basis function. And then we pipe in and say, oh, I want the mode to be regression. So this would be a model specification that does regression. And we can then say, oh, but this model can also do classification. So we need to upfront say, this model will be doing this kind of task. We also need to set an engine. So in the case of our support vector machine, we have different packages that will perform these calculations. So we have, and, and we need to upfront say, who do you want to do these calculations? So here we have TurnLab as one of the ways to do it. And we also have Litwit SVM, which is another background engine to do this. So then when we are doing a model, we are saying, so we said earlier, we are gonna do uh, use a, a lasso regression. So we start by specifying a logistic regression and we set mix to one, so we did a lasso. And then we pipe in and say, I want to do classification and I want to use GLMNet as the bat end to do the calculation. And that, this takes like no time at all because then it's just a specification saying, this is what we want to do. And then we have a model object with these things. And we noted then that we have a little tune up here. So we have a little tune at that. Oh, that tune. What are we going to do? Yeah. Um, Emil, uh, wh what if we took our break now? Do you think that yeah, would be Yeah, I think a break would be a good time. Yeah, yeah. That tune. So we're going to leave you right now. Like, oh, no, tune. What is it? What are we going to do? Um, so uh, we've been sitting here for a long time, and so have you. So I think the next thing we're going to do is take um, a five-minute break. So let's come back at 15 after the hour. Um, I'm going to just turn off my video and mute for, and for the next five minutes. And I, I recommend everyone get up, stretch, stretch your toes, stretch up, reach up, get a glass of water, and then we'll come back. And the next thing we are going to talk about actually is the tuning and what is, what does that mean? And what is it that we're going to do about it? So, um, let's take a, um, a five minute break and then, um, be back at 15 after the hour.
All right, we about ready to start again? Yes. So, so we are roughly halfway through, but we're taking a lot of the we a initially bit. thought. A little bit. Well, um, and hopefully, I don't know. I have the time, but I don't know if. Yeah, we'll try yeah. to. Um, yeah. Let's see. And we have like a couple of open questions, but I feel like we should just wait with those to the end. The, to... the ones that I see here, I agree with you, Emil. I think that's a good idea. The 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 couple that I see, we'll we'll take at the end. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I think we will go to. We yes, we're a little bit past where we'd like to be. So we'll we will go. We will see how much we can do in the next twenty minutes or so, and then take questions. Oh, okay. Then does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. I will probably skip. Maybe let's. Um... Uh, I think we can skip trust validation. Okay. Well, let's do yeah. that fast. Do it fast. Yeah, that yeah. sounds good. And maybe right. skip the live coding for variable importance. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, when we, so welcome back everyone. We are so glad you are here. Um, so when we train models, some of the, um, model parameters, we can learn from data during fitting and training. You know, if you've fit, you know, a linear model to some data, you're like, yep, I learned the slope and intercept from the data, but it turns out some model parameters cannot be learned um, during training, they and we call these hyperparameters. Um, we so we just cannot learn some of them. There, we like what are like what are we gonna do? And so these we call hyperparameters. So how how do we go about learning these? What we do is um, we train lots of models, and we with all with different combinations of these hyperparameters, and we compare them, and we see which ones did better, and we use that to um, to estimate which parameters are the best ones or the right ones for our data. So um, that's what tune means. When we had tune in those places, that was us saying, I don't know what the best value for this is. Instead, I want to try different values of it. And so now it's time for us to go ahead and do that. We're going to make a grid, in this case, a grid of possible hyperparameters here. So here's how I can go about setting this up. Think about this as us say, as, as us, you as the model, um, modeler saying, um, I am doing generalized or I'm doing, um, regularized, uh, uh, a regularized linear model, but I don't know what the right amount of regularization is. So I want to try a range for the regularization penalty. And, uh, I am putting tokens into this model, this, this like text model, but I don't know what the right number of tokens is. So I'm going to put a range in here and then we're going to try a number of different model levels. So then we end up with a grid that looks like this, where it says, okay, here are the values for the penalty. I'm going to try here are the values for the tokens I'm going to try. And then we cut, we're then we're faced with, okay, great, great. Here are the values I'm going to try, but how am I going to compare and evaluate these different models? What is it that we that uh, that we are going to do? And I just have a tweet note. So if we go back here before, we specified the range, but all of these uh, hyperparameters have fairly decent default ranges. So you don't necessarily have to specify them. All right. So. We imagine up here at the top, we have all our data, which we already split into our testing data set and our training data set. But if we just applied, so we want to try all these different things, but we can only use our testing one. So we need to find a way to assess all these different hyperparameter uh, combinations without touching the testing data set. So we'll be doing this by taking resampling our training data set to create an analysis and assessment data set, which a little bit is like training and testing, where we apply 
to analysis, evaluate on assessment, and we do this a bunch of times to find out how well we're doing. So as we said before, we do want to make sure you're spending your data budget very efficiently. So we are doing something called uh, Enfold Trust Validation. So we are take so we imagine you have your data right here, where each row is like each column is a data set. We split it into different folds. So here we have five folds. Then in our first split, we take the we made one of our folds the assessment data set and all one analysis. And then we slide along to that a bunch of different resamples of testing and training. And then in this way, we are trying to spend the data wisely because it's a limited resource, what we have in our training data set. And this allows us to assess multiple different variations without having to touch the training data set. So now that we have our the resamples, so the resamples is the trust validation sets, we have the features and we have the models. So now let's see what we do now. That's right. And so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a workflow. So um, we have our resamples. In this case, those are those folds here that looks like this, where each we have so this 10 fold cross validation. So the these are these splits, which are the same kind of thing that a testing train split is where it keeps track which um, which things go in which in analysis or assessment. And then we have a recipe, which in this, we, we, we talked about that earlier, right? This is our data pre-processing recipe. And we have our, um, our, uh, our model specification. And notice we've got, we've got, you know, we're saying some things are being tuned and whatnot. So it's time to put those things together. So we put those things together in something called a workflow. So a workflow is a convenience function to put, to put um, pieces of models together. So for example, if I just added the, um, if I just added the data preprocessor, it would say pr the preprocessor is a recipe and model equals none. So it has like slots. It's like Legos where you put things together and it gets everything ready for you to fit a model. So it's a, um, a convenient way to carry around different pieces of a, um, of a modeling pipeline or a modeling workflow. And so now once I add a recipe and I add a model, it, it says, ah, oh, okay, you gave me a model and you gave me a, um, you gave me a, you gave me a preprocessor and you gave me a model. So now I'm ready to go. And so what, so the, the benefit of using, using a workflow is it's, uh, is it's convenience. It's protection against um, uh, data leakage, like we call it, like we talked about before, and it's how it fits into this um, this uh, ability to do. Um, uh, uh, tuning, which is what we've been talking about with this, like we, we want to track, we don't know what the right values are, for example, for regularization or um, the right number of tokens. So I'm going to um, uh, go back to the slides. Uh, can you go back to the slides to show the tuning? Um, because uh, that is slow. So then now we're going to tune. So tune you can tune in a couple of different ways we're going to show kind of here like a straightforward way to tune which is where you take your your now it's time to put all these pieces together the workflow which says what is the preprocessor what is the model the resamples which are the data right that we're tuning on that grid remember that is um uh, what, what are the possible parameters we're going to try? And then some, some details about the modeling. So a control, like uh, in this case, we're going to save predictions so that we can explore them later. So the output of this will look a lot like the, the cross-validation folds where we have the splits, the fold, but now we have some things like metrics and predictions. Um, and so we, so this is our, these are, are our um, our results that we have here? Um, you one thing you noticed um, as we went through this is that um, we did quite a number of pre-processing steps. Um, 
uh, including um, tuning the number of tokens that we had here and that we, um, and that we were using n grams. And that's some, something that we haven't talked about next. And that's what we're about to say. Yes. So I'll be talking very briefly about what we really mean by tokenization. So very general term tokenization in the domain of NLP is splitting some text into smaller pieces of text, which we will refer to as totems. And the most common token we work with is generally a word, but you can also totemize to other things like subwords, small sentences, or even characters themselves. And it is an essential part of most test analysis. So most, any time you do something, you want to turn it into tokens. So you have something to count. So you want a smaller unit than the whole test by itself. And as always, there's a bunch of different little options of how you do tokenization. So here I have a little example of uh, a complaint we had in our data with some slight modifications. And the first and most naive way of totenizing is splitting this string of characters by white space. So that would be spaces, tabs, new lines. So we see we have everything as we have before. And we noticed that punctuation and things like that stay in it. So we have me period because it's not being removed because it's not white space. Another popular option in the R ecosystem is the totenizer package, which if you're using a tidy text is the main bad end for tidy text. So that has a more sophisticated uh, tokenization procedure which still takes the test, test, but turn it into different kind of totems. So the first immediate obvious thing here is that we don't have periods and everything is lower case. And we wrote, we have the steps this algorithm is going through in the book and it's quite complicated. <laughs> And then let, and as another example, we have the Sparsi library. So this is a Python library to do NLP. And we have a bad end via the Sparsi R, um, R package. So that's a, they have a different algorithm to split text into totems. And if we look at all of these side by side, we see that there's a lot of differences in how they're doing it. So the token asset patterns by default turn everything to lower taste and remove any kind of punctuation by default. But the Spasia keeps a lot of, keep everything upper taste, but keeps like so in long time hyphenated, keeps the hyphen as its own token and split doesn't up here into two tokens. So it, it's, a, it's not necessarily a better tokenizer, but it's a different one that may or may not affect the way your tokenization is done. So we have a lot of considerations when working with this, like how do we deal with uppertase? How should we handle punctuation? And what do you do if there's like that non-word title inside of words? Or do you hyphenate it? Do you keep it? Do you split it? A bunch of different ways. And something we won't really be talking about a lot right here, but you also could have the idea of multi-word expressions. So if you're having, uh, looking at text from the political in America, you would probably want a White House to be its own token because it's, it's one unit by itself, but you need to find a way to the tokenizer to accept those. And like, Luckily in one way and unlike in other ways is tokenization in English text is quite a bit easier than most other languages simply because the idea of a word is very cleanly separated by spaces. So it's very easy to, you can get quite good performance by just using a white space separator because the notion of a word is so 
insert old in English, but you have a lot of different problems in other languages. And we touch upon that in the book as well. And then since we're using end drams in the model, let's just briefly go over what it is. So an end dram is a sequence of n sequential totems where n would be the number of sequential tokens. So doing this captures the words that appear close to the other. And we're even able to detect notation. So we, if the words not happy appear a lot together, we can find that in the end drams. The, one of the downsides of this is once we start counting pairs of sequential tokens, the tight analysis draws wild like draws like polynomial with the number of n in our end dram. And here's just an example with using the total analysis package. So we see up here with n equals one is just the same as words. But once we do n equals two, which another way also called by dram, we see that we have every pair of words. And we start seeing right here in the middle, we have identity theft as being one unit that's worth counting, which seems like, a, for me, it seems like a very good unit to be able to count that in our final model. And down here we have a long time, and then it's worth kind of feel like they cohesively fit together. And then we have more in our book in chapter two about how to do tokenization. Awesome. So um, let's talk about um, when we have tuning results, what do we do with them? Like, how do we get from we tuned to we know we know what to do next? So the the tuning has results in a metrics column. And remember, we said uh, we were we trained a whole bunch of models. We're going to evaluate and see which ones we did we did best. And the metrics are what we use to say which models did best. In this case, we use the default metrics for classification, which are um, ROC, AUC, and accuracy. And so if we do collect metrics, it just uh, gets all those out for us. And we can see for every combination of regularization parameter, like penalty, and number of tokens, um, what, what, um, what uh, did we get there? So that uh, gets out, that gets out the metrics, but with, if we want to, but it's better to visualize it and be able to see what, what actually is going on. And so there's a, you know, we can, use, we can get a pretty nice visualization out here and the, we can see what, what's going on here. So as the regularization in, um, uh, changes, the ROUC AUC changes from, you know, very good to quite bad, like, right, that, that, that's, it's down there by, by 0.5. And we can see that there, um, there's, <clears throat> there, we also see some change with the number of tokens there as we go from like 500 up to 2000. And so uh, we, we can see the change that we get with, that we get out there. Um, we, we can get the actual best ones or we, or we can see, we can see, okay, of all of those that we had there, which ones are the best? So these are the five top performing models. Notice in this case that they do all happen to have the same regularization parameter and that they have different number of tokens. Also notice um, uh, the top tokens, you know, they're not necessarily the biggest, the biggest models in terms of tokens. They have a lot of tokens, but not necessarily the top. So which is um, kind of a sometimes interesting to see. So these are some of the, the results that we see. And we can actually get out, okay, what is the best one? We can get out one model, because really that's what we need from tuning results at the end, is we say, I got to get one. We can choose them in different ways. And in a, in a, you know, if you're used to using regularized models, you might say like, I want, you know, a simpler model with one stand, within one standard you know, error or whatever, and you can get that out. But for this case, let's just say we want the best performing model and you can get that with a function called select best. There's other selectors available for, to you, but in this case, let's get out the best one here. So we can get out the best. So that, so we tuned, we get the best one. We can also get the, um, the predictions. And if we have the predictions, we can, we can evaluate in a different way visually and actually look at um, ROC curves for, uh, 
Um, and in this case, we actually had um, 10 resamples. So we can get 10 ROC curves, one for each um, resample that we have here. And so this is when we resampled the, these data set of complaints. We trained, you know, this model for each one. Um, or we tu you know, we tuned it each time. What were the ROC curves? And, and we, we see here, this is, this is the, the kind of ROC, uh, ROC curves that we got here. And um, uh, we can visualize what it is that they look like. And these are very helpful for, under, for um, uh, being able to evaluate how uh, the model did. So at, when we get here, to the, we're getting here to the, like the end, we, we trained, we explored, we tuned, and then we can, we can actually then update um, the workflow uh, with this best ROC AUC, and then the model is ready to go. And we can, we can um, you know, save this and use it with, um, with new data there. Yes. So lastly, in the last couple of minutes, we'll be talking about how uh, the model actually is deciding what to do. So let's just step over this. So I'm taking using the VIP package and using the VI function that will extract the uh, very importance of the different features in our final model. So we can start visualizing how well how the test influences our predictions. So here we have the top 20 something totems from the test and how important they are to determine if something is a credit complaint or a other complaint. So we see in the other identity theft too, for some reason, is indicated that this is not anything to do with a credit complaint. This is oh, it's probably in one of the other very specific groups. And we can see that it seems to fairly well. If you look at the other side, we have agency experience, fair credit, attached credit, chat services. So we have a lot of voices that actually feel that they're making sense of how we're doing it. So we created this little visualization. So we take one credit complaint and we have colored each of the tokens that only has that unit uh, uh, unit ramps and colored them depending on the variable importance so here we have a credit complaint and we see some very bright like equifats and credit store and credit a bunch of credits around and they are pulling it to be more of a credit compared to a uh, other. And we have another one right here. Then we have credit report reporting it with ads, pulling them towards a trade complaint. And here we have other, same deal. Then we have a lot of non green words because this just happened to be a not trade related one, which is why we're classifying this as another. And then we have right here. Awesome. I love those visualizations. I think they're so helpful for understanding what is the model doing? What is the model doing? Which is um, uh, so valuable. Okay, so we, we, we updated the workflow. We understand some about what the model is doing. And so finally, finally, we're going to do something with the testing data. So there's a function called last fit, which is very convenient because what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to fit the model one last time using the training data and then evaluate it on the testing data. So that's what this, what, that's what it does. It takes that finalized workflow. It takes the split, the, that testing training split and says, we're going to um, do this one last time. And then what we can get out of it is well first yes just notice this is the first and only time we have used our testing data we have not touched it before now we didn't use it to compare um or decide what to do um decide which what regularization parameter or anything and then what we can do with the output of this is we can look at metrics for example this is these are the metrics evaluated on the test data 
And fortunately for us in this case, we can, we can look back and see that these metrics are about the same as what we evaluated on our resampled, our resampled uh, training data, which means we um, have done a pretty good job here. We or like we are not, you know, doing a terrible job with our fitting. And we can also get out the predictions on the test set and we can we can end up with a another ROC curve that shows that we have done um, a similar here thing as well. So what at the end of all this at the end of all of it, we have started from um, a very uh, raw un structured text data. We transformed it to features that can be used by a machine learning algorithm. We, we used resampled data to tune. Um, and then we have talked about how to evaluate data and ended up here with predictions on our test set that we can use to evaluate there. So, um, Emil, you want, what do you want to say to as we wrap up? Well, I'd like, at once again, I would like to thank all the organizers, both from our ladies Argentina and the USA 2020 organization group and all the sponsors. And of course, I would like to thank all you viewers to come and listen to, watch us talk about um, everything we've been talking about. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, agree with that so much. And I know we're a little bit over time already from what we said, but um, Emil and I do have a little bit of time to take some questions. I know that some of you probably need to go, but we, um, as long as the organizers have a little bit of time still, um, we can stay and answer some questions. And we just want to thank you all so much. Thank you to the organizers and thank you all who came. And um, we can stay and take um, some questions as they, um, as they come in here at the end. Stop sharing for now. Yes, awesome. Um, all right, so I'm gonna open up the I'm gonna open up the Q and A, and yes. um, so there. So I'm gonna just kind of go up a little bit. Um, so we did go over variable importance very briefly. Um, uh, <clears throat> we did go over it super briefly. So somebody <laughs> expressed some interest in like, hey, what was that? That went by really fast. What's variable importance? And um, uh, and how did we do it? So I'll start and say one thing and then maybe Emil, you can, um, uh, uh, maybe you can ch chime in a little bit. The, yes. so, so variable importance um, uh, is, is one way to approach the question of like model explainability, like model, um, uh, like what is driving your model predictions? Um, like what is makes a model more likely to predict one way or the other, or higher or lower, or something like that? Um, in the in in, the, in some cases um, that you can have model the variable importance is directly related to the kind of model that you have. And that is true in linear models, um, including regularized linear models. And so it's, um, uh, you know, we can get them out pretty directly. It's also true in the case of like tree-based models, you can get directly out a measure of variable importance because you can, you know, you know how everybody's, all the trees are voting and stuff like that. Um, in other cases, uh, you, you can't get out directly a measure of variable importance. And so you have to go to model agnostic measures. And so if you're do, training something like a support vector machine, it's more like a black box, right? And so you have to do, um, you have to basically use um, simulation and, and to get out some measures. But there are approaches to do that. And so we, um, we have some and we're going to develop a little more about how to measure um, variable importance for text models in, um, yeah. Do you want to add anything more about variable importance, Emil? Uh, I'm going to add a little bit by answering our question. So we have one about the uh, taller text visualization, which is almost visualizing the variable importance. So for now, there's not a lot of dirt uh, tools to in R to visualize these things. You can use the code from the slides, which is available in the repository. I probably will get around to writing a more formal package 
one day to easily assess uh, models with test features from timing out of tidy models one day. Yeah, okay, I'm scrolling up now um, and going down. Um, there's a question about, uh, should we try more than one stop word and compare performance? And there's actually the uh, example, a case, it says case study stop words in the regression chapter, the machine learning regression chapter, where we show exactly that. And yes, um, uh, that is, we, yes, we actually, I think that would be a recommended course uh, to say like, hey, should I go really conservative and only remove a few stop words? Should I, you know, should I remove a lot? Should I take one of the big stop word lists? But one of the great things about um, this kind of approach that we're, that we're kind of showing how to do here is that um, th it's like very fluent to be able to do that and then compare um, the performance. Because like you don't have to just guess, you can try and then see what works best. So yes, absolutely. And, and to add with the whole stop word list, there isn't a universal way of finding what a stop word is. And it all depends on like your preference. That is like, like you can start off with using a very conservative pre mid stop word list and modify that. And then you can start looking at like frequency time. So just look at the most frequent words in your trading data set to see, but they're also the most likely word to actually have a effect on your model if they appear a lot. So you can easily weed out other words that don't seem to really add anything. Emil, related to stop words, someone asked like, why would not you, why would we maybe consider or not consider those censoring um, things like the XXX? Why would we, why don't we consider those stop words? So we have to say that stop words because they do convey some kind of information. So we have, so, we don't necessarily know what it is, but once we start looking at multiple sensors at a time, we can start to see, oh, this is a little, a little bit like a sensor date, or it could be a name or credit card. So we have a section on that in the blue two where we explore a little bit what we have in the censoring. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, let's see. I have a tw there's a Twitter. Twi question on from the spicy bat end. So if you, I'm just going to share really quickly because it's an easy question. If you go to the spicy website, spicy.io and click on models that you have a list of the different languages they support right now. And to specific, this question, did you have Portuguese available? And yes. they're uh, slowly adding more to, but it's, it's quite a hard problem to create these language models. And you can, you can use those through, you can't use those other, you just have to like download these, you know, things. Giant and then, yeah. And then you can ask them, access them through R as well. Yeah. Um, there was a question about, um, so we talked about non neural network based models. And there was a question about like, Hey, what about neural network network based models? And like, when are they good or not? And, um, uh, so I, so I have used like in my like real life day job work, some of these, um, neural network based models and, um, absolutely they are, um, um, useful, uh, they can learn, um, they, you know, like they can learn from language, uh, in, in ways that these other models cannot always, um, uh, like, like for sure they, and, and if you've, I don't, if you've gotten a chance to look, maybe not, you're sitting here with us, but if you've gotten a chance to look <clears throat> at, um, uh, the website for our book, like, like that's the third section of our book it, um, is, is talking about how to train those kinds of models and, um, uh, and how to eva train and evaluate those kinds of models. So for sure, they're an important tool in, um, in dealing with um, uh, predictive models for language. They, they also have, um, they have like, you know, like upsides, downsides, benefits, and then uh, negative things about them in terms of how long they take to train, um, how interpretable they are, and um, the, <clears throat> if we're, 
for a lot of purposes, they're not always they're not always the best answer. So they're great to have as options, but they're not always the right answer for every um, for every purpose. Anything and you want to add to that, Emil? Yeah, and we will touch upon where the different kind of models have their time to shine in the book too. And like one, one uh, thing I can think of is that any kind of deep model starts to struggle once you don't have that many observations. But all these town-based models we looked at right now works very easily on short data. So we yeah. did a, before we end up this example, I had an example of 200 uh, abstracts and it worked flawlessly with uh, GLM net which we would probably have a very hard time building a deep neural network to classify that. There are a couple of questions about tuning. What, what is it? What does it mean? Um, do you want to start or? Uh, or um, I, I can do you start. have a specific you... one? I, I can, I can, I can start. Um, so yeah. like, what is tuning? What is tuning? So some, some models, um, uh, like, like if we wanted, if we started tuning, or sorry, if we started to train a model, like, um, uh, the, a, a, uh, like a model with like a, for like a text data model. And we were like, oh gosh, it's time to decide how many tokens to put in the model. We could either just decide, right? Like just pull some value out of the air and decide that or we can try many values and pick the best one. Um, that's a pre-processing step. Um, and the, that process of trying many values and finding the best one is the process of tuning. There also are models that work that way. Um, uh, an example is, you know, we showed the GLM net example. There's also, you know, if you've ever trained an XGBoost model, model, um, it's one that its parameters need to be tuned or a decision tree model. It needs to be tuned because the, the, the um, defaults often are not the best for any given data set. You have to try lots of them and then um, find the best one. There are some models that don't need to be um, tuned, like, uh, like Naive Bayes, right, Emil? Like, um, yeah, it, it, I think it has a top of like uh, a low town uh, adjustments, but more or less it doesn't have, have any uh, parameters. And so for like a text data set, you don't really need to tune it. So, you, so it does not need to be tuned. So tuning is the process of I have some model and I, there are things in it I can't learn from the data itself. So I have to try a whole bunch of options and see which one performs best. So, in, so options you have are try a whole bunch and see which one becomes best or or some more sophisticated approach like a bayesian like try this oh it's better go this way go this way you know like some sort of like um tr like smarter approach you know, uh, to try to like get to the right answer or whatever um so th those are the ideas of tuning yeah um, all right. I think we're, I know people, we've been here a long time and I really appreciate um, everyone who's been here. There's um, m maybe for one last, um, I think we got most of these. Uh, I guess there was a question of like, why did we go to two categories and what would we do if we did not want to just have two categories? Um, so, Emil, we actually talk about this in the book, right? Yes. So, we yes. have a section <laughs> where we are doing the, the same thing as, as right now, but with trying to build a classified and template it into any of the eight classes. Yeah. And talk about how that is different than just one. Yeah. 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 So, I think, uh, I know everybody's been here a long time, so let's let's call that good for questions now. If you have, so um, you probably saw the GitHub repo. I think there was one package missing from the GitHub, from the, our markdown that's there. And so we'll, we'll uh, push, fix that and push that up there. Thank you very much for the note on that. Um, we also have some notes 
there if you want to work through this on your own and like some places to ask questions. So if you have other questions that you want to get answered, um, Emil and I will both like be watching for that. Um, uh, it, I think um, uh, the organizer shared um, the please not to forget to fill out the survey about um, the USR 2020 survey. So please do that. Um, a, a, organizers, do you want to share anything here at the end? Yeah, um, well, we, I think we have a, a really great tutorial. Um, thank you so much, uh, Emil and, and Julia, for this. Thank you so much to all the people who, who come and join us. We have uh, more than, ha, I don't know how to say this in English, 130. Can you help me, Juli, Juliana? Over 130. People Attend. connected today. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much. We, we really enjoy it. Again, we are going to share all the links for the GitHub repo, for the slide, for the armor down uh, with, uh, in Twitter uh, for all the chapters. We are here today. We are nine chapters from Argentina. So don't worry. You are going to get all the material yeah, we see here today. Uh, so thank you so much. I think we all people here, um, we need an applause, a big applause. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, please, uh, yeah, we have a mini our ladies there. Yes. <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. We are recording this. We are going to upload the video to the YouTube uh, channel for our consortium in, in user 2020. Um, please uh, fill the survey. Uh, it's really important to improve uh, this uh, kind of conference, especially because next year is going to be global. So maybe, maybe we can have some of these events here in our region again. Uh, so, well, I don't know if anyone else want to say something else. Please unmute. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, see you soon. I'm going to end the meeting now. <laughs>